Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Joe Adams, and we would like to uh, thank you all for taking your time to participate in our program today. I think it's going to be a very interesting one, and uh, we're, we're excited uh, about it. I, I would start by noting that uh, today's program is the second of a three-part series that uh, we're doing. We did one yesterday. Um, for primarily for Sanibel and, and Captiva folks. Today's is aimed at Fort Myers Beach. And then tomorrow we're doing one um, generally for Lee County. And we try to focus some things um, unique to those communities. There's you know, some overlap and some things that would be of, of interest uh, in, in all of them. Uh, I, I would particularly, if you're interested, um, would commend you to look at our program yesterday. These are available on our website, uh, they're recorded. And there was a really telling presentation from uh, Stephen Lodwick, who's the uh, owner of uh, Island Management. I think they manage 75 or 100 associations on Sanibel. And um, you know, one of the, the themes of, of, of today's program is kind of expectation management. Um, there is, I, I think, a, a pretty common uh, feeling in every community that the people next door are ahead of us. Our board's not doing what you know needs to be done. Um, and there, there were some really interesting statistics uh, from that, including on Sanibel and Fort Myers Beach may be worse. Seventy-five percent of the condos still didn't have power. Um, I asked uh, how many uh, have settled their flood claims, answer zero. Uh, how many have settled their wind claims, answer with the exception of a couple where the buildings were just basically knocked down and the damage was well below policy or above policy limits and policy limits were tendered, zero. So, um, you know, it, it, it's important to, you know, kind of understand, you know, the context of you know, of the, um, you know, of the community. Um, one of the things that's really a big deal on Sanibel is the FEMA 50% rule because they do not really, they don't have high rise buildings. It's going to be less of an issue presumably on Fort Myers Beach with high rises. Some of you will have to, you know, address that. So again, I would um, commend your review of what Craig Mole of the Sanibel Building Department had to say yesterday about this. Obviously, you're not in Sanibel, but you know the law is the same. And tomorrow, we're going to be having uh, Sean McNulty, who's the chief building official uh, for Lee County, which I believe administers um, the beaches permitting program. So. Uh, a lot of stuff um, that, you know, all kind of swirls around at once. Uh, so today's program, uh, I'm going to um, first thank our, our co-sponsors, uh, Sanibel Captiva Community Bank and uh, Condominium Associations of Fort Myers Beach or CAFMB. Uh, we've supported CAFMB for, for years. We're uh, privileged to speak pretty often at their, at their programs. And uh, we, we appreciate that, um, you know, that relationship. Um, with respect to the Q&A, um, just to be clear, uh, if you have questions that I can try to fold in, I'm going to serve as moderator, you know, for them. Um, the, you know, it's not, you know, speed dating, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, answer every question thing. We'll, we'll try to take them, you know, into account, um, you know, as, as we go. So we're going to start today's program with uh, Craig Albert. Uh, Craig is the founder and uh, chairman of the board of Sanibel Captiva Community Bank. Um, Craig uh, has lived in Southwest Florida for 40 years. Uh, he founded uh, Sandcap Bank in uh, 2003, 20 years ago, uh, as what started out as kind of a uh, uh, one branch um, uh, shop, primarily geared toward the residents and uh, businesses of Sanibel Island uh, in those 20 years. Uh, the Sandcap has grown to one of the largest, if not the largest, 
uh, community banks uh, in Southwest Florida. Um, they do um, substantial business on, uh, on, on Fort Myers Beach. Uh, Craig has uh, had a particular emphasis uh, given his roots um, in, in, in the Sanibel community with condo lending. Um, they do a lot of condo loans. Um, and so um, that's Craig. I, I, I guess his, his greatest claim to fame is that uh, I've been married to his sister for the last 40 years. So, um, you know, you can lucky me. <laughs> yeah, you can pick your friends. But um, so I'm going to ask Craig to kind of focus on two things. Um, number one, as a uh, you know, business leader in, in, in the community and a banker to a lot of the small businesses um, on the beach um, to kind of share your thoughts on, you know, kind of where we are, what this, you know, what Ian looks like compared to the other storms you've experienced in your 40 years here, including uh, Charlie and Irma. Um, and um, just kind of your, your, your thoughts on the timing of recovery and how this is going to, you know, kind of impact tourism and, and all the things that go into, um, you know, just more than reconstructing each individual building, right? Sure, Joe. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us today. Um, yeah, there's really not much of a comparison between uh, Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Charlie. Uh, Charlie hit in 2004, and, and it did create uh, quite a bit of damage, but uh, Ian is, you know, 10 times worse than Charlie. Um, I know Fort Myers Beach was, was you know, devastated, uh, probably worse than Sanibel, I think. And uh, it's going to take uh, years uh, for you know the communities to to rebuild and to recover. There's not going to be any there's no tourist season uh, in 2023, you know, at all. Um, we're hoping that there will be some uh, some buildings will be rebuilt and there will be some units able to be rented in, in 2024, but I think really it's going to be the season of 2025 when um, hopefully uh, things will be back to normal and we'll have, uh, you know, you know, a lot of tourism and a lot of revenue gen generated both on Fort Myers Beach and on Sanibel. So uh, this is, you know, by far the, the worst storm that we've seen. I guess Francis Bailey was on our board of directors and passed away a number of years ago. He's a pretty, he was an icon on Sanibel. And he told me, I think it was 1926, it was maybe, or 27, that a wall of water came over the island uh, just like this. So it's been about, a, you know, almost a hundred years since we've seen, since anything like this has happened as far as I know. And in 1927, there was obviously no causeway and Sanibel was agriculture. At that Correct. Time. Yeah, it was an agriculture island. So in, in your experience, because I know that you've done uh, a lot of disaster loans, um, Irma, Charlie, um, you know, I know that you, you loan outside of Southwest Florida and the Keys and whatnot. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm asked a lot is, you know, what's a real, I mean, obviously every community is going to be different, but, you know, what's a realistic timeline to put Humpty Dumpty back together again? I know that after Charlie, for example, South Seas Plantation was closed for three years. The Sundial Resort was closed for like a year and a half. So, you know, recognizing that uh, this is much more substantial than Charlie, uh, primarily because it was a double whammy with unprecedented flood damage. I mean, what, what do you think we're looking at to really see Re, any uh, return to a semblance of normal in these in these coastal communities? Well, I think it's going to phase in. I think that uh, some of the, you know, on Sanibel, for instance, we have a number of businesses and restaurants that are up and running right now. We probably have a half a dozen uh, restaurants that are actually opened. Uh, I'm not sure about the beach. I know the beach got hit a lot harder. I think uh, it's going to take a little bit longer down there for, for Fort Myers Beach. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a phase in thing. Uh, gradually, uh, businesses are opening up. And this year, you know, 
uh, you know, 10, 15% of the businesses might be open by the end of the year. And then next year, uh, more and more businesses will just come online. But a lot of it's going to depend on the rebuilding of the uh, condominiums and the hotels. Uh, we need places for uh, the tourists to stay. And um, that's going to take, uh, in, a, in a many cases, a lot of the hotels um, are either on Four Myers Beach, they're already gone, or Sanibel, their structures are there, but they're going to be demolished and they haven't even been you know, knocked down yet. And then they need the permitting process to get permits. And uh, you know, I think you're, you're looking at every bit of you know, two and a half, three years again before we're back to where, uh, where we were. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I've, I've seen, and I don't know if you have any thoughts or experience on this, is, you know, the labor force that services these islands is, you know, a group of people that, um, you know, I don't know, itinerant's the right word, but, you know, they kind of follow that lifestyle, they like the beach, etc. And once they have no work for a year, they move to, um, you know, Fort Lauderdale or, you know, Apalachicola or whatever, or they go to work in the construction trade. So, you know, as the business in, you know, we were in a labor shortage before all of this hit. Um, are you hearing concerns about uh, availability of labor when things start getting back to normal to service the, you know, kind of the service industry? Not really at this point, Joe, everybody's just scrambling to try to the businesses that are trying to get open. They do have the businesses that are open, have plenty of workers that want to come back and work in the, in the restaurants and so forth uh, that are open now. Um, I think that's just something that that is an issue. Uh, but I think that one's on the back burner right now. People are just really trying. They're dealing with their insurance companies, their contractor, they're trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, get open or rebuild and, and deal with that. But that'll probably be a concern, but not not for a while. OK, so why don't we move to um, lending and uh, you know, talk about, um, as we discussed yesterday, kind of um, what you see in your history in condo lending and how you're dealing with lines of credit to bridge the gap when people are waiting for insurance monies and, you know, all, all, all of that. Right. So, let me, yeah, I think uh, I'll just start off with the, the most of the condo associations are going to need a construction line of credit. And what we'll do is we'll issue a line of credit that they'll draw on uh, gradually to pay their contractors. So that way the interest clock will only run on the money that's drawn down. Initially, it should be a smaller amount. And then as, as progress is made on the reconstruction, then, then obviously the balance of loan go up and the interest payments will increase. Uh, on those loans, we've never required any personal guarantees from any of the unit owners or the board of directors. Typically, the terms of those loans are usually a two to five, maybe six or seven year term um, of, of the, the length of the time of, of the loan. And we'll do you know, a one year line of credit. And then after that, we'll start amortizing the principal balance of the loan. And it's just really math. We back into the repayment based on what the condo association board and we're talking in advance of this, obviously, so we all agree on it. What they'll they'll uh, assess, they'll do a special assessment uh, for the condominium owners, and then what we do is we take an assignment of that special assessment, and in there, uh, that's how we'll work out the repayment of the loan. And the easiest way for me to kind of describe how that works is just to give you a scenario of, of what could happen. So say we had a 10 unit uh, condominium complex and uh, they needed a million dollars in construction funds and they did a million dollar uh, special assessment. Well, that works out to $100,000 per unit owner or per unit. And then it's up to the board of directors of the condo association to decide um, how they're going to assess their unit owners and get that money uh, repaid to the bank. And so, um, so one way they could do it would be to do an annual special assessment for four years. If they did a $25,000 annual special assessment uh, for four years, that would basically 
uh, repay the loan over a four-year period of time. So if they did an assessment on December 31st of, say, 2023, the first $25,000 uh, repayment, um, then the bank would, would have a principal reduction due on January 31st of 2024. That gives the association a month, basically, to collect the money and then uh, make a principal reduction on the loan. It doesn't have to be an annual uh, assessment. It could be a semi-annual assessment. It could be a quarterly assessment. But what we work with the association so that we're in agreement in advance of how, how it's going to work. And then we just match our repayment terms to when those uh, assessments come in. And uh, that's that's pretty much how it works. And it, it could, like I said, it could be a four-year term. It could be a five-year term, two years, three years. That, that we would work that out with the association, you know, obviously in advance. So, you know, one of the things that I would note about dealing with SANCAP as opposed to, you know, some others is your your loan requirements are, you know, I I, I think pretty bare bones. I mean, I, I'm looking at a condo loan right now that you know, came in and the closing package on it is like buying a football stadium or something. I mean, there's like 30 documents. It's kind of crazy. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that um, Sandcap has basically only required a pledge of the special assessment as collateral doesn't require these um, you know, attorney opinions that says all your documents that you draft that are valid because attorneys charge a premium for that. They're taking on liability. So, I, I mean, you do make it easy. Uh, I, 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 I would say that. And I, I think to, to associations, um, you know, if you are looking at lending money, you, you need to ask and, you know, in the commitment letter, what are the closing um, costs going to be, origination fees and all of that, and, and what are the closing requirements? Because if you have to spend a lot of time and money in, you know, the, in the closing, it's also part of the, uh, the transaction cost. So Craig, I know uh, you have to, um, to go to another um, commitment. We have Ruta Hammer here who's gonna fill in for you if there's any questions. Right. Uh, Ruta is actually uh, the one who does all the work anyway. That's absolutely right. She's the one who figures out what, what we need. But you're right, Joe. Uh, you know, we, we understand that the condo, uh, condo associations are nonprofits. So, you know, we, collect, we know that, they, that their financials aren't going to show a, a big profit or cash flow. We kind of hang our hat on that special assessment. And with that, I'm going to step aside and Ruta is going to take my chair. And if there's any questions, uh, Ruta can, can handle it from here. Thank you, Joe. Okay, yeah, thank you, Craig. So we're gonna go ahead and move on and um, we will Sorry about that. My iPad chose to die for some reason. So well, I'm going to introduce the uh, Honorable Matt Caldwell, who's the Lee County property appraiser. Uh, Matt has uh, served in the Florida legislature. Um, and uh, because my iPad just died, I'm uh, having trouble um, <laughs> up your bio. So I'll well, you, you that just means you don't have to read all those pairs. Well, yeah, now, now I've got it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So he's seventh generation Florida native. Um, wow. From a uh, family from Micanopy in 18, uh, 1826. Um, so, uh, you know, Matt has worked uh, in uh, political consulting. Uh, he served in the, in the Florida legislature. Um, he's um, a, an icon in the local business and farming community. Um, and he's uh, kind of the star of the show today. So, Matt, I'm, I'm going to ask you to um, go through um, the new uh, property um, tax issue, which everybody uh, is, is asking about. Uh, as, uh, as I think everyone knows, the Florida legislature met in special session um, in December and adopted SB4A, 
which basically has kind of two legs to it. One is retroactive uh, tax relief or rebates or whatever the right word is for 2022, if there uh, was uninhabitability, and then uh, forward-looking relief if your property value has been, redu uh, been reduced due to Ian. So take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you indicated, the special session did uh, result in, uh, or at least one of the things it resulted in was a tax relief package. And uh, this actually uh, basically cribbed from a bill that our property appraiser associations had proposed and were able to pass last session in the regular session that was going to take effect in 2023. Uh, after most hurricanes, the legislature historically has adopted some kind of tax relief, but it was different and the, the minutia uh, it, it would be uh, a little bit different application each time. And so our associations came together last year and said, hey, let's, uh, let's create a standardized way to tackle this so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, each time. <clears throat> and of course, we had hurricanes Ian and Nicole. Uh, that just happened to come through the state before that bill took effect. So what you saw in 4A uh, will actually be uh, essentially the, the permanent process as well in the future following any future storms. We won't have to have a special session. Uh, you will be able to use this process for tax relief. And it, it boils down to this, and we think about it in, the, in a single family home context, though it's also applicable to, to any residential property, condos included. Uh, but <clears throat> if your home was uninhabitable uh, for at least 30 days following a, uh, a, an event, and it's uh, bigger than, in the regular statute, bigger than just a hurricane, but specifically in the 4A applies to Ian and Nicole. Uh, if your home was uninhabitable for at least 30 days, and for all the rest of the days in 2022 that it was uninhabitable, you receive tax relief on the improved portion of your property. So essentially, you couldn't live in your house, uh, so you're not going to be made to pay taxes on the house for that portion of the year. Um, and uh, we, as the property appraisers, are the ones that evaluate that. Uh, folks need to apply uh, to receive this tax relief. The deadline for uh, this particular tax relief is April 3rd. Uh, so our Lee County residents <clears throat> need to make sure they get that application in. Uh, they can go to our website, leepa.org, leepa.org, and right on the very top of the homepage, uh, you will see uh, all the links for, for all the things we're probably going to talk about this afternoon related to uh, responding to the storm, but most especially for the tax relief, uh, we have taken the Department of Revenue form and digitized it. Uh, so that you don't have to actually print it out, sign it, scan it, find someone to scan it for you and email it back. You can actually apply <clears throat> through our online portal. Uh, then we will evaluate uh, the, the, the submission. Essentially, you're going to tell us your story, uh, what the situation is. And uh, we are constantly, have been since the storm hit, gathering information about all the properties uh, that we think were potentially impacted by the storm. And so we'll compare the notes uh, based on what people submit to what we've got. Uh, if it matches up with what we've already determined, then that, that gets processed and sent on to the tax collector for them to, to, uh, to process the actual refund. Um, if we need more information, obviously, we're going to reach back out. <clears throat> as, we, as I think about uh, the audience we're talking to today, uh, this is a really critical audience, uh, frankly, uh, for us, and, and one which I would love to see interacting with our office, uh, because you're going to know. Uh, you're going to know, as the, as the condo managers in particular, uh, which buildings have been uninhabitable. Uh, a question I get is, how does that get evaluated? Obviously, if somebody's home was completely washed through with water uh, and they couldn't live there, it was uninhabitable. Uh, but in the context, for example, of condos, you know, the upper floor units may not have sustained any physical damage, uh, but no one's been able to occupy them because of the state of the whole building. Uh, my position as the property appraiser in Lee County is that those are uninhabitable. If you've been prevented from using your property uh, as a result of, of a police power or some similar force, uh, 
uh, we're going to give you uh, take the position that that is uh, equal and contemplated by the statute. And so uh, all of your property owners that have been unable to use their property should be applying for this and receiving that tax relief. Wow. So um, I guess one question is, how are the um, governmental units that were supposed to get that money going to get by without it? Yep, that's a regular question. Uh, so during that special session as well, the legislature uh, funded uh, all of the additional uh, FEMA contributions. So I believe the formula is local government has to do 15% of the cost. That's either 10 or 15%. But anyway, um, the, the legislature wrote that cost for all the local governments. So they do not have to come out of pocket for any of their FEMA response. Uh, and then <clears throat> part of the idea of having the application deadline be uh, by the end of March, essentially, uh, potentially gives us the opportunity to put a number on this total package uh, and get that to the legislature before the end of the regular session. A lot of the conversation has uh, uh, been about how do you potentially provide uh, relief to the local governments, basically replace this lost revenue. Um, and the, the hardest thing about trying to do that back in December was honestly not knowing what that number is going to look like uh, until we really got to scale and had people start applying, uh, being able to put a reliable uh, uh, number to that was just not realistic. But uh, I expect we'll be able to before the end of the regular session. Okay, so let's let's break this down a little bit uh, on on this part. Um, let's assume, for the sake of discussion, that a uh, a condo unit on uh, September twenty seventh or twenty eighth was you know whacked by Ian and people still can't move it back in there. So for so so, so basically then. Um, the unit was uninhabitable for three of 12 months, just using rough math, right? So that is um, basically uh, one fourth of the year. So let's say the taxes on that unit, it's not homestead, are $6,000 a year. Um, so taxes are due in arrears. So the 22 taxes, I think, are delinquent by what, March 31st? And you can pay like in November with a discount, is that right? Uh, typically, uh, now a little, little extra complication was both the executive order and then was adopted in the legislation as well, was an extension. So any, any Lee County taxpayer uh, was given an extra 30 days in general, so uh, and that was just to, to 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 face the reality. We could not finish the tax roll and get the tax bills out on time this year. Uh, we had several taxing authorities, if you'll recall, budget hearings for local government are held in September. Uh, we had, I think, three or four local governments that could not conclude their third public hearing uh, because they were scheduled for the 27th, 28th, 29th of September. Uh, so those didn't get rescheduled and held till about three weeks into October, our tax bills went out uh, basically the week of Thanksgiving. So about three weeks late. And by executive order, this year, all Lee County taxpayers had an extra month. Now, in addition, everybody who was who met the threshold of uninhabitable uh, got an extra 30 days beyond that. So if you're in that class of people that qualify for a refund, your actual bill is not due until the end of May this year. So let me, let's understand how this works. There, there's a form, I think it's uh, Department of Revenue form DR slash 5001 is on your website, right? Yes, the, the form is, and as I indicated, you have the option to use the online submittal, uh, which makes right. things quicker and easier for you and for me. Oh, you fill, you fill in the fields, right? Yep. Yeah, great. So, so let's use our, our I, I, I think, easy math hypothetical. So the taxes on this unit are six thousand a year. Um, it was a thing in prorating each day, rendered uninhabitable for a quarter of the year. So I'm basically going to be entitled to fifteen, pay fifteen hundred dollars less in tax this year, right? 
Potentially. So uh, one of the things we are still working through and, and looking for some advice from the Department of Revenue on is, is making sure we are equitable in our application. So if you think about, in simple terms, a single family context, your savings is, is applicable to the improved portion of your property. And that's relatively easier in a single family context because we can separate the house from the land uh, because you're to continue to pay taxes on the land. In the condo scenario, uh, those of you familiar with how we build the tax roll in Lee County, we don't assign a value to the distinct condo association owned portion, the land itself. Uh, we allocate that equally to all of the unit owners. Essentially, it's, it's captured that value for the tax roll purposes is captured in each of these separate unit assessments. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're equitable in how we apply the refund and we're working through the kinks on that. Uh, and always dangerous to bring up an interesting scenario with a bunch of lawyers uh, in a presentation. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is- Anything you that, say can will be used way. against you. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's exactly right. But, but our, our intention is, uh, as I laid out, we're going to, to deliver this uh, tax relief to the condo owners, just the same as the single family owners, because it, it applies, the statute applies right. to all residential property. So, so you're saying, if I'm interpreting you correctly, that the exact amount is still the subject of being, I mean, it's a pretty new law, obviously. Yes. So the, the exact amount is not necessarily gonna be equal to a prorated number of days divided by the total tax bill if there is a land component that is supposed Correct. to be included. <clears throat> Correct. You still, you, you are not getting relief on the land because the land uh, was still there and still, is still a valuable item. The, the relief is applied to the, to the, uh, for the idea that you couldn't use the improvement, whatever that is in whatever context. So, yeah. Well, I don't know how much too different those two things are yeah. uh, in like <laughs> be, a beachfront condo. I mean, I can see if you own a sure. hundred acres of land and you're farming it, you can still, you know, plant your peas. But uh, if you have a beachfront condo, nobody can go use it. But well, that's interesting. So, I mean, so is the Department of Revenue going to adopt rules on this or is the Property Appraisers Association just going to kind of get together and come up with a consensus or do you have any sense of that yet? We're, we're going to have an answer before the end of this month. I mean, it, it, as, as a functional reality, there's only a couple of us from property appraiser standpoint that are in this situation. Uh, there's only a couple of us that really have condos that were impacted by these storms. Um, you know, all the, all your interior rural counties really don't have, uh, that I can think of condo situations. Their, their context is almost exclusively, you know, right. single family structures. Um, gotcha. so we have an opinion of, we have an opinion about how we do it, but part of the challenge is that we have as property appraisers, as constitutional officers, discretion in how we develop the tax roll when it comes to condos. And as I indicated in Lee County, we don't develop a separate allocated value for, the association's property, the association's interest, we capture it as as a part of each of the individual unit owner assessments. So we, we've kind of created the scenario for ourselves, not having anticipated we'd have to do the math in a different way for this purpose. Right. So let's say um, it's, this form is due April 3rd, and then I think you have until June 1 to respond. Is that right? Or July 1? Correct. I think it's June 1st. June 1, yeah. So your bill is due before then. So you got to pay your bill and wait for a refund. I mean, that's basically it, right? You can't deduct it from what you think you owe? Uh, yeah, you, you will need to pay your bill uh, beforehand. Now, our intention is to, to process these as quickly as possible. And to date, all that we have received have been processed on our end. Uh, we, we are kind of piling up on the tax collector uh, to get to, to her work because she obviously has uh, not only these refunds, but also the regular tax roll that she's processing on a day-to-day -day basis. So a lot of, a lot of uh, work landing on her desk right now. So you and I discussed, and I think this would be a good uh, opportunity to share your thoughts on collaboration with the condo community through uh, CAFMB um, to kind of create something that makes less work for all of us. Because if you get, you know, 24 applications from the you know, um, drunk Siegel condominium or whatever it is, um, and you know that place was whack, you don't have to look into it 24 times. So 
how do you see the condo community and the managers and the boards and CAFMB kind of working with your office to say, all right, this, I, I mean, I think on Fort Myers Beach, the list is going to be, the, the, the short list is going to be which ones weren't rendered right. uninhabitable for the, the whole year. So, but that being, you know, setting that aside, you need obviously to verify this uh, under your, your your legal duties as a constitutional officer. Do you have thoughts on how this can work for the benefit of your office and these folks that need this relief? Absolutely. So we were already uh, working with uh, the Secretary of State this last week to try to get an efficient data uh, download of all the condo managers for the entirety of Lee County. Uh, but those that are on this uh, this webinar and on your others uh, that want to be proactive, I would encourage them to reach out to us uh, because it's not just this tax refund uh, that we need to make determination about, but we also need to prepare the 2023 tax roll based on the condition of the property on January 1st. And so uh, it will make all of our lives uh, incredibly easier as well in that, that context, uh, rather than making 24 different uh, interactions, being able to work directly with the association manager on what's the condition of the building, right? All, all, particularly out on Fort Myers Beach, uh, have you gotten the sign off uh, that the structure is safe? I mean, have we got the engineering reports? Have you got uh, the, the, the details that have signed off that this building is ready to go? Or will it be however long it's gonna be until you feel like uh, that answer is gonna be derived? But uh, being able to get that efficiently uh, for the entire complex uh, makes everybody's life uh, much, much simpler, for sure. So, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, you know, I think you heard from yesterday's program, 75% of the Sanibel condos don't have power yet. So they're, they're not habitable, obviously, mm -hmm. at least to the, how I would interpret, you know, her, interpret that term. And so why don't we then move to uh, what you just gave a sneak peek of, which is the second leg of 4A, which deals with how to seek tax relief for diminution in property value occasioned by, by Ian. And I'm gonna ask um, uh, my partner, Aaron Frost and partners and Sanjay Kurian um, to also kind of keep their ears pricked up and jump in if they want to, because this may have some relationship to the FEMA 50% rule because my understanding is what you, Matt, have to do is fair market value. The FEMA regs are a different kind of value, but you know we don't want clients shooting themselves in the foot by reducing their denominator to the point where you know they're going to have to raise the buildings up 20 feet off the ground so you know individual owners can get tax relief. But let, let's just focus on your part of it right now. Can you explain what 4A did? on you know, adjustments for tax relief and kind of how you see this playing out? Sure, I mean, it, it, it is trying to uh, give a standard way to approach this next year's valuation. So the uninhabitable statute for tax relief in 22 is really a binary question. Either it was or was not inhabitable. You could either use it or not use it. The extent to which damage uh, was a feature of the property there was no gradation there, right? Whether whether it was, you know, there was just no power and the and the police wouldn't let you on the island all the way to the building was washed away. That that all fit in one category of uninhabitable. When you move to 2023, uh, now, as you pointed out, we have to put a, a, a market value on it, the just value uh, like we do normally, but we need to have an efficient way to consider what what is the condition of the property at this point. And, and the real uh, takeaway for your audience is the communication. Being able to efficiently communicate between our office and the condos so that we can understand what's the situation on the ground. Uh, because uh, just like in, in the, the previous conversation, we have, uh, a, we, ha we have a scale of uh, destruction that's created some new mm, expectations, some new processes potentially for us. Uh, I'm, People will start hearing next week uh, some radio ads to, to kind of get the public to respond on these questions at a scale because we put it at around 100,000 properties in Lee County that were impacted by the storm one way or the other. Uh, and if you understand our tax roll is about 
550,000 parcels. Uh, we have to visit, personally visit everyone once every five years. So our normal cycle is 100,000. You know, discounting for those that are overlap, we've just doubled our workload. Uh, the number of properties we've got to physically visit between now and June. Um, and so the efficient exchange of information is the only way we're realistically going to get that done and, and be able to then answer the question of what number do we put uh, on these properties that have damage. These properties that I've been told anecdotally from folks that it's not just damaged, uh, the estimates are it'll be two, three years before they're going to be back uh, into the property, just like you were talking about was the case for South Seas and some of the other resorts. Uh, you, you're going to see the same kind of situation, I suspect, for these condo complexes. The same, the same issues are at play, whether it's a, a commercial resort or a condo, in my mind. So what, what is, I, I mean, the law has always said you're supposed to assess just value. And if, you know, the values decrease, I guess it is what it is. What, what does this law specifically try to do that's different than what the general law has been? <laughs> that's a great question, Joe. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, I, I think our opinion would be that it's kind of repeating what is the process more than creating something new. Um, but uh, we, um, we, we're, really <laughs> we're really in the phase of data collection at the moment. I mean, okay. our, our conclusion on how we're going to, to figure this out at the end of the day is honestly closer to an April decision. I mean, when you look at the context gotcha. of, our, of our staffing level, we've right. got, we've got mm, I bet, somewhere around you know, 100,000 properties we've estimated as who's been impacted based on where we think the flood, the flood in particular went. So you've got to imagine we're going to deal with probably at least 75,000 properties that were actually uninhabitable that we're, that's our number one focus is getting that processed. And while we're doing that, not repeating that work, gathering, because the information we gather for the tax refund is going to be applicable very likely to our January 1 context. And, and so right now it's get as much data in the door as fast as possible. Uh, in fact, we had been, you know, post COVID, we had been in, in like a lot of places, a lot of flexible work arrangements, a lot of folks work from home. Uh, and in fact, as of this last week, we're all back in the office to launch from the office and uh, everybody is liable to end up being a field staffer. I'm, I'm gonna start going out myself uh, and doing the field inspections just so we can try to possibly get this done uh, to even actually go go lay eyes on these properties before we even figure out the value side of it. Is it true you're only doing the ones with good fishing holes in the backyard? <laughs> I, I heard that. But. Well, in, in fairness, I, I have told them I'm going to take the islands, but mostly because we've got uh, we got to be efficient. You know, we, you figure in the South Cape, uh, everything south of Cape Coral Parkway has to be visited. Um, that's tens of thousands of properties we got to get through right there. Do, do you have, uh, have your, has your office uh, made any effort to calculate the dollar level of property damage? Yep. So we, we have done some initial estimates just to give the four corners. Um, the, there's still some math inside of that. But if you, uh, to, to think about the geography we've drawn, take all of the islands uh, and then on the mainland, just go up the river and draw to the, the main roads, right? On the Cape side, Cape Coral Parkway, Del Prado, Bay Shore, North River Road. On the south side, you just follow St. Carlos Parkway, McGregor Boulevard, Palm Beach Boulevard. And so you think of that geographic lasso, uh, that's about $40 billion in land value in there and about 66 billion in taxable value. Uh, now, of course, the challenge is that, that uh, taxable value reflects after you've done all the different calculations for each one of the properties based on their exemptions, their classifications, their cap. So it's not a, it's not a one to one, uh, but you figure the land hasn't gone anywhere more or less. Although if you are a Matt Lachey, we do have one little thing we're going to have to, uh, in, the, in the bucket of things we've got to figure out is what to do with Matt Lachey. We're quite literally, uh, we might have a property rights question we got to answer about the land being gone. Uh, but everywhere else, the land is still there. The land value is unlikely to change. Maybe even in some indicators has even increased since the storm. 
Uh, but you figure that that I mean, a beachfront condo that gets knocked down may be worth more than it was before if they would <laughs> put a you know resort on it. That that is exactly right. I've I've shared with many of these association owners or managers that have talked to me. They they need to have serious conversations with the residents. If it's going to be two, three, four years to get your condo repaired, you may be much better off from a financial standpoint. Wildly better off from a financial standpoint to tear it down. Uh, and either sell it or start over. Um, you know, th those are going to be some challenging conversations, I'm sure. So, so, but to the, the, the put a cap on that, somewhere in that 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 extra 26 billion of value is some portion of that's been lost. Now, um, there's a possibility that from a tax roll standpoint, that that's a bit of a paper loss uh, because of the increase in the tax roll that was already occurring, right? So those numbers are based on January 1st of 22 and the market was still going up, went up all of, of, of 22. Um, so, you know, from, a, from what does the number look like at your library district or for the school board or for your city hall uh, may not be a, a decrease in the tax roll. It just remains to be seen. Um, we're, we're, we're very early yet in, in analyzing the year over year data. So is 40 billion land value was 66 billion taxable value is obviously not all gone. I mean, this is billions of dollars of damage. Mm -hmm. Potentially, yes. Okay. So let, let's, let's kind of put a, 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 a cap on the, the, the issue that we don't really need to deal with now because you have to figure it out and you've got to deal with the 22 refunds first. And I, just to understand the process, generally um, the trim notices come out in April. That's the Truth and Millage Act notice, which basically says, if the Board of County Commissioner adopts the budget that it was, this is what your value is. It's probably what your taxes are going to be as estimated tax bill. So it says your prop, your home is worth, you know, $459,000. And if you think this is too much, you can file within 20 days, a petition with the value adjustment board, and we'll have a hearing. And if it's worth less, you have, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it. And there's a whole process. And there's a process for condos to do it on behalf of the whole group, if they want to do it and, and all that jazz. So, um, you know, we were in interesting times now because in, you know, the drunken Pelican condominium, the units have been, you know, selling for $650,000. Uh, you look at the place and you can see daylight through the first two floors and we have no idea what's going to happen. It may be torn down, it may be rebuilt, you know, the insurance money, blah, blah. I mean, what is it? What is it? What do the unit owners and the drunken pelican have to do? What are you going to do? I mean, how are you going to deal with that? That's a really, really <laughs> great question, Joe. Uh, so the process from a from a how do they interact with us is the same process. The trim notice, as you indicated, goes out. It goes out in August. Uh, you have 21 days to file a petition if you disagree with that. Uh, we always encourage everyone to reach out to us first. Uh, because any, any factual error, uh, any impact on value that's a result of a factual error, you know, we've got listed, you're a three bedroom, but you're a two bedroom. You don't have to file a petition to get that resolved. We're required by law to fix that upon being notified. So factual errors, uh, easy. Uh, and then opinion questions, we can always work through. Uh, with, huh, with these condos, uh, we will approach it from a common sense perspective. And in, in an appraisal, although we use mass uh, appraisal or the valuation technique, uh, the, rest of the rest of the methodology is what everybody that, that has any familiarity with appraisal will know. We're going to look at the building, and if we don't have any sale data to give us an indication, then you're going to have to use depreciation, uh, an appreciation metric, probably apply it to last year's uh, plus also cost replacement depreciation. I mean, there's really only so many ways you can get to it. Uh, wow. Ultimately, ultimately, we're going to have to, what we can't do is make it an absurdity. It's the same answer I've given people that have asked me, you know, how are they going to do 50% rule on at the city or the town or the, or the county? And my conclusion has been, 
don't turn it into a, an absurdity, but for the fact that it's owned as a condominium structure, it is ultimately a multifamily building. And so what, what is that, if, if you get in a tough spot, you step back and say, what's this multifamily building worth? And then how do you allocate that out? Uh, and a building that has uh, you know, received substantial damage, uh, it's, it's not impossible to put a number on it. You go through that, but it gets back to our earlier point, Joe, which is communication makes this really, really, really much smoother. So knowing exactly what the damage is that's been itemized by your engineer, contractor, et cetera. And as you get through the process and you get estimates on what it's going to take to get the building back to uh, whatever the threshold is, habitable, you know, green light from the town, et cetera, though having those numbers and communicating it with us will make it far easier for us to, to come to a conclusion that doesn't involve any kind of petitions or litigation. Right. Well, we like litigation, but uh, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we so, still take yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this because, you know, let's say the drunken pelican is five stories tall. There's four stories a unit, 20 units, easy math, a uh, million dollars a unit they, they've been selling for. So first two floors are washed out. We have two floors of open air space and three floors that were what they kind of were. Um, if I got a first floor unit there that was worth a million dollars on September 26, I don't know if I could sell it for anything. Um, the third, but you know, it's going to be rebuilt. So, you know, assume it's going to be rebuilt. But if we use that appraisal for the FEMA 50% rule, we're going to have to tear down the building and raise it because we're saying it's not worth anything. So th there seems to be a lot of moving parts to this. I guess my question would be, this is not something that I think can or should be answered today, but is it in the interest of associations to consider, you know, prior to the trim notice for, uh, for, uh, process coming out in um, um, August. August, whether they want to bring some kind of appraiser in and consider one appraisal for 50% purposes and a different appraisal for fair market value purposes. I mean, is that something that you would look at in trying to come to a fair resolution of property values? Yeah, and, and honestly, you shouldn't have to pay for two appraisals. Uh, for the 50% rule process, all of the, all of the math uh, that, that ends up being used to determine 50% is downstream of a fair market value conclusion. That, that's the first step in order to develop that, that FEMA appraisal. So you should be able to use that. That would be incredibly useful. Uh, you will find in, in interacting with our office, uh, unless we find the private appraisers to not be credible uh, as a professional, we're, we're going to give a lot of deference and weight uh, to their conclusion because they, they have focused on that specific property as opposed to our mass appraisal, which is a, a, a a regression formula that gives you a number for 500,000 properties all at once, basically, and is and is correct as far as the law goes, but is not as accurate as an a, a site specific property specific appraisal. It just can't be. That's recognized as appraisal practice. Um, so, to to you know, what is this going to look like? We'll have to see how the next six months play out. You know, at the end of the day, the, the they're worth something. Um, as you, you described, the first floor unit's been completely washed out. It's not worth anything. Well, I think it's worth at least a dollar. Uh, I think any of us would take that bet, right? Uh, so you, 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 at, at the end, no matter what, every property owner has a something, has a fractional interest, an undivided right. fractional interest in the property. Uh, if, if at the end of the day, that's nothing more than the land. But as you indicated, and I agree, the land, uh, it, it may not be the nothing more. The land may actually be the most valuable asset if the building has really sustained substantial damage. And so you, you've got at the very least that interest, and then you've got the scenario of, uh, you know, what are people willing to pay? And I, I suspect, uh, honestly, by June, although we will have to use data from 2022, I think the intentions of the marketplace will start to become evident over the next six months. I think we will see sales of these condo units. Um, you know, they're not going to reflect what they were before the storm. Uh, they're going to reflect, you know, financial situations that are unique and we'll have to work through that or whether that's really market value. 
but it's in the constellation of value and it helps inform our understanding of what's going on in the marketplace. Yeah, and we've seen a few sales already, actually, uh, which you know is is fine. I mean, so final question: um, If you know, does how does this apply to timeshares? Hmm. <laughs> so we, that was one so of the questions take, on the chat. So I figured yeah, no, I have no idea. So I'm going to ask you. Uh, you. You take all this really not complicated conversation we just had about <laughs> condos and make it even worse. Um, <laughs> so I mean, the the, the reality is. Uh, you go back, fall back on my statement earlier. Uh, we 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 always have to ensure we don't make an absurdity out of the valuation. Mm -hmm. And so, in the case of timeshares, you have all the features we just talked about with condos, but now you have even even deeper fractional interest based on the, usually weeks per year. Um, and so, we uh, look to the the resale market. We we look at the same data anybody else does. Where's the resale market? Both the both the official and the and and the you know off off market market uh, that we know there's two that always occur in the timeshare universe and what are the discounts uh, for those fractional interests that you see evident um, both you know we look nationwide statewide and then as best we can develop metrics within Lee County uh, and look for differences between that and that's that's going to be that's the standard process set, set aside the hurricane and of course now you bring the hurricane into it and all those buildings that have sustained damage go back to the things we just talked about. If, if you are the manager for that timeshare building uh, and you've got an appraisal, a private appraisal for your 50%, as soon as you get that, give us a call and let's, let's get the ball rolling on that as well uh, so that we can, so we have at least a starting point where we're, we're working from the same position uh, and then we can work through the metrics. And Aaron Pruss, I mean, one of the things we've been seeing is with these appraisals, um, the appraisers know that for FEMA, you have to evaluate different things and that appraisals call for permitting purposes only, right? So that's different than a market value appraisal. Well, it's, it, it depends on the jurisdiction. It's, it's a market value appraisal, but it's being prepared for permitting purposes only um, with the intention that it, it's, it's the benchmark or the denominator for the 50% uh, evaluation for FEMA. Okay, so uh, uh, property appraiser Matt Caldwell, thank you so much. We're going to move to uh, Ellen. Are you there still here, Ellen? You're on. Uh... There we go. Hi, Ellen. Uh, this is uh, our partner, Ellen Bogdanoff. Uh, Ellen is also a, a former state legislator. Uh, she was a member of the Florida Senate for uh, quite some time. Uh, Ellen works in uh, our government practice group. Uh, she is the chair of our Sea Level Rise Advisory Services Group. Uh, Ellen has been doing some uh, consulting work uh, with some uh, Fort Myers Beach associations regarding um, seashore uh, permitting regulatory issues. And uh, we asked Ellen to come today to share her thoughts on um, the effect of, you know, a, <laughs> I'd call it a biblical, certainly historical storm um on our region and what we might see and what was I, I think an already increasingly regulatory environment on um seashore use because a lot of many of your beachfront condos and your rights in that beach are you know very central to your property values so ellen take it away well thank you joe um there th that's a lot <laughs> There's been a lot going on, as everybody knows. I mean, we had the building safety bill uh, that passed that kind of talks about um, resiliency for uh, particular buildings. I think a lot of people may also know that the state put together, and I don't know if everybody has a copy of it, the Hurricane Ian and Nicole Recovery Plan for Florida's Beach and Dune System. So that report is out and that allocates money to all of the different beach areas that were damaged during the storm. Instead of how it usually happens where the counties kind of decide, you know, this is the money we want for our dune restoration, for our beach restoration uh, to protect us against storm events. 
Um, the state actually went out and did their own evaluation of all of the damaged areas and came out with their list. The report is online and I'm happy to share that report with you. I can probably put it in the chat if you'd like. Um, so well, why don't you send it to me, Ellen, and then I'll send it to um, um, the folks at SCAFMB and they can post it on their, their group. Um, that would be great. A very, a very efficient <laughs> way of doing that, yeah. But, you know, with every uh, storm like this that happens, um, new ideas always pop out. Uh, and a lot of times, le you know, legislative fixes, what do we need to do to help people recover faster, to uh, encourage them to create more resilient, um, you know, properties and to rebuild properly. So we are working <clears throat> on behalf of a couple of our clients, some very significant legislation that will hopefully give people some options as they start to talk about rebuilding, Joe. Uh, one of them is quite simple, but it's, 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 it's simple, but it's, it's, I don't, complex, right? Um, it's called freeboarding. Uh, freeboarding is the amount of space between the base flood elevation and where you build your property. And for a lot of places, especially places like Captiva and some of the islands, they have a very strict height restriction. So if somebody wants to protect themselves and now build their property instead of a couple of feet above base flood elevation or five, they may want to go seven or eight feet, which means that the building is going to be really short. So what the, what the language does that we're proposing to the legislature is to voluntarily encourage people to build higher and not have that count towards the height restriction. That way we can build more resilient properties, you know, in some of these areas where we know there was devastation. Um, that's one of the things we're working on. Um, another thing that we're working on is res fi resiliency financing districts. And this would potentially give condominiums as well as other geographical footprints opportunities for longer term financing because they would be able to assess themselves as a non ad valorem tax Matt, you might be interested in this uh, ad valorem tax on their on their um, on their on their property tax bill. So whereas I guess the you know the banking industry is talking about these short term loans to build out, these would potentially be longer term loans. This is a very uh, heavy lift. It's a big complex piece of legislation uh, that we've developed over time. Um, and we're in the process of trying to move it through the system. Uh, we've kind of run it through all the traps. We've talked to House leadership, Senate leadership, Department of Environmental Protection, the governor's office. Um, everybody's intrigued by the idea, but it is uh, what they call one of those big, bold, hairy ideas that we have to see how it plays out in the legislature. But that's some of the things that we do uh, in our practice group, I've gotten into the resiliency space and just trying to solve some of the problems where giving people more flexibility to protect their own properties and to basically take care of their own problems. The resiliency districts will give property owners more authority over the fixes for what's happening in their properties, whether it be repetitive flooding, whether it be that they have to raise their roads, whether it have to be if you're a condominium and you you have to kind of harden your property, um, whatever whatever it might be, it's going to give them more flexibility to control their destiny versus relying on government to do the work. So I would assume then that if a a condo property has to be torn down and rebuilt, they're going to have to deal with all this. I mean, this is going to be part of um, new construction requirements? Well, we're not talking about requiring anything on the freeboard piece. What we're trying to do is uh, encourage people to do it. It would be voluntary. And what, what would happen is the local governments would have to kind of recognize that if I want to lift my property for seven feet, right, then I get to still go up to the 35 feet. You can't you can't shave another if base flood elevation say is two. You can't shave, you know, another whatever three feet off of my building. You got to let me go the extra three feet so I can actually, you know, build what right. I need. But that would that would be a state statute or that would be a local option. No, that would be a state statute that gives the local owners of the property the ability to do this right. and apply to the local government, which cannot cannot penalize them for raising right. their property and trying to be more resilient. 
Right. And I, I think there's height restrictions on the beach. I'm not sure what they are. Sanibel, I think, is three stories. It's 12 foot flood elevation in some places. So if you went up 20 feet, you're, you could still go up three stories using Correct. that example. Sim Correct. Simplistic. Okay. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the work that um, you, uh, you know, had been doing uh, in Southwest Florida about, you know, what you see in the regulatory scheme uh, of the issues you've been dealing with and how you think that increased, I don't know what the right word is, concern about these bad storms we're getting, global warming, whatever, is gonna make things worse, we gotta do more. I mean, what do you see down the road? I mean, Florida's not known as a highly regulated state, but you know, are people that, um, uh, regulate our beaches are kind of like them. So um, you know, they're, they're, they're environmentalist types of people. So what, what do you see, you know, coming down the pike? I mean, the, you know, many of the beachfront condos on, on the beach have, you know, white sandy beach that they rake every day with a tractor. And, you know, that's what people bought and that's what people come to stay in. Now people want, you know, dunes and, uh, you know, whatever there. So what do, what do you see coming? Well, you know, I, I think I think there's a little bit of a battleground going on, right? So I've worked on Fort Myers Beach. I've worked uh, in St. Johns County, Summer Haven Beach. There's there's a reason for dunes and for the opportunity to protect your property, right, against storm events. But there's also those that are trying to create an environment for more sea turtles. So I don't know necessarily that they're competing, right? but there's a different purpose for what people are trying to accomplish on the beach. What we've worked on is not so much, you know, building dunes and building certain infrastructure for the benefit of turtles as much as for the benefit of protecting private property, right? So we were behind, um, our clients were behind the always ready legislation, which was landmark legislation passed in the state, which provides, it's, been, it's provided up to 2 billion already in local grants for uh, erosion districts, for municipalities and for counties, for specific projects to protect infrastructure. I mean, that's the key. We have billions and billions of dollars of exposed infrastructure that has got to meet the future of sea level rise and flooding, right? Because, you know, flooding is just a product of many different things. And we've, we've, or have taken the forefront. Actually, Florida has been at the forefront of a lot of this stuff. We're ground zero for flooding and sea level rise. And it's just kind of amazing what's happening, but it's been very quiet. It hasn't necessarily always made the front page. What makes the front page is when the street floods. What hasn't made the front page is all of the money and the effort and the new legislation that the state of Florida has moved forward to try to give Floridians the ability to deal with these future events 20, 30, 50 years up the road. Uh, part of the legislation created the Florida Flood Hub, which is out of the University of South Florida. And they're gonna be gathering data so that we have a statewide look at all of the damage that could potentially be done in the state of Florida, where the main infrastructure projects have to be, not just what private owners will do, but what municipalities, counties, and erosion districts need to do to protect private property as well, especially as some of our critical assets. I mean, we have a lot of critical assets that are at risk because of sea level rise. So Florida has been doing great. I mean, we, we could always do more. But um, you know, this is unprecedented. The legislature and the governor supported nearly $2 billion so far. And every year they keep funding the Resiliency Trust Fund to make sure that we continue to do these things. So what can the people on this call do to get a piece of that $2 billion? Well, um, as private property owners, it's a little bit harder. If you've got folks that are municipalities, if you, you know, one of the first things they have to do is have a vulnerability set, uh, assessment, right? You need to understand your, critical assets, you need to understand as a community um, what those are and what we need to do to protect them. So the first step is a planning grant. And every year the, the uh, portal opens up with the monies there and it's on the Department of Environmental Protection. And you go in and you just simply apply. And actually Southwest Florida was, was quite rewarded with a lot of the grants. Uh, the South Florida Water Management District got a a significant number of 
of dollars in order to deal with some of you know their critical asset issues. So they need to just kind of keep an eye out. We can go ahead and send them maybe Joe a little toolkit, right? So, um, so they they have to prevail on their elected officials to do it though, or the the administrators of the elected officials. So I mean, correct. They really can't do it as a private citizen. Not as a private citizen, but some of the new legislation that we're working on is uh, citizen initiatives. So the resiliency districts are citizen initiatives, right? Mm -hmm. And if there are critical assets that are incorporated that are public assets into a project, they would potentially be allowed to access that money as well. Um, you know, we, we're hopeful that it passes this year, but again, it's a heavy lift. And that is a citizen initiative where 70% of the taxpayers within a certain geographical area petition their local government to create their own resiliency district to solve their own problems. And we have a number of test cases where, you know, government just doesn't always act fast enough or they have so much going on. You might be, you know, 29th on the list, but if you want to move yourself up, you're going to have to take matters into your own hands. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. That was that was interesting. And um, this, <laughs> you know, we have the, the the world as it ages, and then things like Ian that seem to age it like <laughs> a few centuries quicker. So, uh, with that, we're going to turn to um, I'm going to tag team these these two guys, uh, Sanjay Kurian and and Aaron Pross. Um, Sanjay and Aaron uh, are both uh, board certified uh, construction lawyers, uh, board certified by the Florida Bar. Uh, both are partners with me in the uh, Fort Myers office of uh, the firm. Uh, Sanjay is the office's managing shareholder. Um, you know, <laughs> it's been a wild, three months or four months or whatever um, it's it's been. Um, I uh, live, my mailing address is Fort Myers Beach. I don't live in the town. I live uh, kind of near uh, the um, um, Boardwalk Caper condos area, a little bit more inland than that. Um, I had eight feet of water in my house. Uh, I did not evacuate probably one of the worst decisions I ever made, but I did get to see Ian uh, firsthand um, and it was brutal. I mean, the wind uh, battered for eight hours and the, the, I mean, there were literally boats and cars floating down my street. So, um, you know, Fort Myers Beach, Sanibel, um, Captiva, actually not as bad as Charlie, in my opinion, uh, Pine Island, all of the Iona district, um, you know, massive in, in many cases, existential damage. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously when dealing with condo associations, we're dealing with volunteers who are usually experienced in something else that are managing millions of dollars of other people's assets. So uh, it's been, been an interesting um, time. And um, I have been dealing with primarily, I'll call them corporate issues, which are procedures, powers, assessments, et cetera. Um, Sanjay and Aaron's particular uh, areas are what I would call, uh, probably have three or four legs on this stool. Um, one is for what we call first party insurance. Um, we handle um, claims with um, insurers, uh, if they're not following policy, not paying enough, et cetera. Uh, we work a lot with public adjusters. Uh, as I indicated earlier, it's still very early in that process. I mean, nobody has settled their insurance claims, including me on my house. So I'm not even close. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something to discuss. I think of more immediate um, um, importance is what we call project management. The post-hurricane landscape has several phases. Um, phase one is what we call the remediation phase. It's the emergency, you know, dry out, 
shore up that. And by and large, that has been done in most places. Some are probably still waiting to decide if they're going to have to tear down or not. But it, it's been done in most cases and it kind of is what it is. Uh, we're dealing with clients who are unexpectedly getting $4 million bills for that work uh, when they signed a one page contract and what we do next. But um, the second phase is, you know, kind of phase two, which is all right, what do we do now? Um, and Aaron, I'm gonna ask you to start on the very broad topic of the legal aspects of project management. Uh, what do we do now? Um, thanks, Joe. Well, you know, the, the most important thing uh, moving forward to, you know, into phase two um, is, resisting the urge to rush it. Um, you know, everybody's in a mad dash to get their project back up and running, get units rented, et cetera. Um, doing that too quickly, I think, um, has the potential for causing more problems than, uh, than our clients and, and condo associations already have. So to me, the first thing you really need to think about is, is who's gonna be on your reconstruction pro, uh, project team. And you know what, what I've seen over the last four months are uh, a lot of these first responder restoration companies um, trying to get the reconstruction work as, and be the people doing phase two. And they're, they're doing it because that's what they do. They've swooped in from Texas, from, uh, from Georgia, from California, wherever else they're from. Um, and they're, they're basically pushing this on these associations who, you know, rightly so want to, want to move the process along. Um, they think, hey, they had 30 guys here for the last two months, so they got, they got the manpower to do it. And, right. and also, if you could, you know, they also kind of, use these slippery contracts like we're only going to give you what your insurance company gives you and here's a one-page contract and we'll just do everything you know talk about that too because that's, yeah, that's, blow, that's blowing up every day i think i you need a system of checks and balances so you know leaving this the development of the scope of work to the restoration contractor i think is a mistake uh i think one of the first things uh, association should be doing is hiring a designer, uh, an engineer, an architect, uh, somebody with some experience on reconstruction design, and have that individual uh, make an inspection of the property and develop the scope of work that has to be performed to bring it back to pre-storm condition. Um, that person would then serve as a sort of uh, balance to what the contractor says they want to do. Contractors there to maximize their profit, obviously. Um, and, you know, in my mind, you want to have an independent um, entity developing your scope of work and, and making sure that you're covered on all those phases. Um, moving on, you need, a, you need an actual <laughs> construction contract right? Um, the one page or two page proposal that you get that says, we're going to do your roofing, your HVAC, your windows, your doors, and we're going to repaint and it's uh, $17 million. Um, we only need 10% up front. You know, that's not sufficient. You need to have a contract that outlines uh, the relationship that has very specific uh, protections for the association. And these are all industry and market standards. What's lost in this mad dash to reconstruct after a catastrophe like this is people forget they need to protect themselves. And well, yeah, the like time of pay, time of start, when you're going to finish, uh, warranties, uh, insurance, cleanup of damage. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So go ahead. Right. So, so you know, we we obviously that we do that before the storm for for uh, 
for various projects for our clients, um, it's most important now. And the other issue that needs to be considered is the development of the scope of work should be, at least to the extent you can, um, a collaboration with your insurance companies, because ultimately you're going to be looking for them to pay to do this work. So um, you need to work with the carrier, understand where the gaps are between what the carrier believes was damaged and needs to be repaired versus what the association's engineer believes need to be repaired, and then try and try and bridge those gaps. Um, you know, the, the the way I've heard it phrased uh, from from our adjuster is, you know, you, you got to match up the line items. You know, how much baseboard, how many sheets of drywall, how many cabinets. Okay, and it's that is a very tedious and detailed process, um, which, you know, I think everybody would do well to, to go through that exercise rather than just signing the, you know, like I said, we're going to replace all the cabinets in 44 units. Well, how much are you charging per cabinet? Where are you, what level finish are you getting? Um, all those things should be done upfront and memorialized in an actual construction contract as opposed to just a two-page proposal. Well, it seems to me, Aaron, and disagree if you do, I mean, we have clients that routinely will contact us for a $150,000 paint job, and they realize it needs to be done right. We want warranties, we want cleanup, et cetera. And we're seeing every day these one-page, multi-million dollar contracts that you know, I, I think are being um, signed out of natural human tendencies. Like we need, you know, we're behind the curve. If we don't sign this person up, somebody else will. We're really over a barrel. Um, we need this done. And that's all understandable. I feel the same way. Um, and you know, what, what, what I'm really concerned about is I'm seeing a lot of these contractors are really, you know, selling this, we're only going to charge what you get from insurance. And what happens is they're not lining it up to the, what you're talking about, the exactimate on what the adjusters are going to give for an item. So, you know, let's say you have 10 million in insurance um, and, you know, you just sign one of these things and we're seeing $4 million renovate, you know, uh, dry out bills or, you know, remediation bills. So you say, all right, well, we got 10 million insurance. Here's your 4 million and now finish it up. You agreed to do it for what we have in insurance. Well, your insurance company may only think that was a million and a half dollars worth of work, but you, you know, they're going to give you the 4 million because you have all that damage. So you spend that money. Then that contractor leaves town. You've got you know six million dollars to do nine million dollars worth of work, uh, and that guy you know has left town. So I, I mean, it, to me, you know, it, it's it's really critical to take a deep breath and look down the road of how long most many of these projects are going to take, and certainly use more due diligence than you would for a hundred fifty thousand dollar painting contract. When are you going to start? When are you going to finish? What's it going to be? What's your draw schedule? Um, you know, is it, 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 et cetera. So Sanjay, do you want to kind of jump in here because you've been dealing a lot with the insurance claim? Maybe explain what Xactimate is. Explain how we work with, you know, what what adjusters do. That the insurance adjuster people call independent. They're not independent. And how to kind of, you know, get ready for this pretty long slog through phase two. So uh, I think one of the, the important things to remember is what I think you mentioned early on, and I think Aaron reiterated, uh, nobody's been paid fully on their windstorm and insurance claim. When I say nobody, very few. So the vast majority of our clients and, and, and the condo associations out there, they're kind of in the same boat, uh, which is the wind adjusters come out, the flood adjusters come out, they've undertaken uh, some investigation, uh, visual observations about the damages, they may or may not have put their reports together. Uh, what their reports are usually, you know, uh, hey, well, this is what we observed. Here's our photographs. Um, I think uh, 
you know, we, we've had, you know, I know Aaron was talking uh, yesterday about somebody that uh, he said, hey, you know, I'm leaving Florida. I've got 19 reports to do. And, you know, he's at a hotel and he's got to get them done before the next batch comes in. I mean, so people are behind uh, with regard to the carriers. That's number one. Number two, um, they all, uh, th th there's the issue of what the damages are and that there's something that was damaged. And then number two is the quantification of those damages. And, and you mentioned Xactimate. That's a program that insurance companies, uh, most insurance companies use. Uh, and in response, most of the uh, restoration companies also use to mimic that. Uh, and it lets it says, hey, you know, a square, or a linear foot of drywall or square foot of drywall costs X or a linear foot of baseboard costs Y. And, you know, they put in the quantities and out jumps a, a number. The reality is, uh, for the exact which I've seen for clients, uh, you know, at this point, they don't bear a relation to what's out there in reality, because you can't get contractors to do that work at that cost. And there's supposed to be an adjustment that occurs uh, during that process where the, the insurance carriers then, you know, say, hey, what can we actually, uh, actually get it done for? So there's a lot of moving parts to this. So and, and I know we're, we're getting short on time, but, you know, with regard to you know, all of that and how it ties into the project management and the claims. Project management, you want your buildings redone. And the only way to do that is you're going to have to pay for it. And you're going to pay for it by either, you know, assessing your owners or borrowing the money, then assessing your owners or your insurance proceeds. And so in that context, uh, you know, you have to be careful about not letting the project get too far ahead of the insurance. And in, unfortunately, the insurance proceeds are, are not flowing as freely as, as we would like to see uh, from our end with regard to the insurance and the windstorm. So to that extent, I know a lot of our clients have hired uh, public adjusters. They're, they've uh, you know tried to get people to basically speak uh, insur the insurance pro language uh, back to the insurance carrier. The adjusters I mentioned before, those are not your yours, meaning the association's uh, adjusters. Those are, they're not independent. They work for the insurance carriers. They're paid by the insurance carrier. And those, um, yeah, they have a certain worldview of what is or isn't damaged. The other big thing, because unlike Arma, which and Charlie, which you know those that have lived here lived through, Ian is was both a wind and a flood event. It was not only a wind event, and that complicates the insurance greatly. Because if anyone is familiar with the Hurricane Sandy that struck in New Jersey, uh, at the end of those claims processes, you had carriers arguing over whether the damage at the building was flood or was wind. And in a lot of cases, it's not a, a, a pretty easy to determine. But in some cases, you know, it, carriers will look for reasons not to pay claims. And, and they'll look and say, well, you know, that damage is really a wind damage and we're the flood carrier. That's not our responsibility or vice versa. So, you know, it, it is important from the get go to have uh, your, you know, if you have a public adjuster so that those claims are divided, you know, pr appropriately between the wind and the, uh, the wind and the flood. Uh, and if you don't have a public adjuster and you, you're doing it yourself, one, you might want to reconsider that, uh, how you're doing it yourself, but you also say, hey, we're not going to present a claim and to say, well, whichever carrier it is, you guys figure it out. There, you know, the, the problem with that is you're kind of inviting uh, a declination of coverage or at least some sort of investigation or fight that really had you just broken it up the claim as best you could and presented it uh, might have been a different, you know, a better result uh, in the short term. But those, I mean, there's a lot of claims issues. Don't, but nobody's at this point, nobody, you know, uh, not very few people have gotten paid, very few at all. We're talking single digits to my knowledge. Uh, and, and so th there are some advances, by the way, I have not talked about advances. I've seen advances from both in the flood and windstorm policies. Um, the flood ones have been a little bit larger. But, you know, with regard to advances, you're entitled to them. Your, you know, your, your uh, uh, insurer might ask for a proof of loss to get an advance. Uh, if your insurer asks you to sign anything, proof of loss or anything else, talk to your counsel, you know, whether it's us or somebody else, talk to them and say, hey, you know, what's this about? What rights do I have? What's on here? Because that's going to be important, uh, especially uh, moving along here, kind of given the slow pace of things. And that's my very quick, like, what's what's happening here on insurance? So I, I reviewed the question. I think we've addressed a lot of these. But one question um, that came, um, and I, I think Aaron and Sanjay can both speak to it, but um, are condos hiring construction project managers, clerks of the works? And, um, you know, what are 
what are your thoughts on that? And the question specifically, will the insurance company pay for it, which I don't know that we would know the answer to that, but why don't you guys speak to that? Sure. So one, one it's policy specific. So all of your rights uh, under your particular insurance policy arise under the terms of that policy. So a, a policy might be a little bit different than, you know, in one case than another. Uh, and I say that because sometimes they, they say, well, those guys got this and we didn't get that. Well, it depends on the policy. But with regard to uh, a project manager, clerk of the works type recovery depends on the language, but it depends on what it is they were doing. If they were actually necessary for supervision to do the work, that is generally more recoverable than they were out there discovering what was wrong. Insurance carriers don't pay generally for investigatory work, but they may pay for uh, you know cost incurred to to get the work done. Uh, you know, and and maybe a general contractor's fee is often you know is often paid, but but not always. Aaron, what are your thoughts on the advisability of that and the availability of such services, you know, out there? Because um, you know, volunteers are great, but they're that, and there's a host of reasons why that's problematic. I mean, who what? Who's in the yellow pages that um, you know can solve all of your Ian problems? Yeah. Um, well, in general, I think it is advisable to have somebody who's the association's advocate and is available to hold the general contractor accountable, um, particularly when you see contracts without specific pricing, uh, without well-defined scopes of work. Um, you know, what we saw in the, in the remediation phase, you know, there's no telling how many people were on any project on any given day. You just have to take on faith that your contractor who was doing the work actually kept appropriate track. So I think it's advisable to, to hire somebody, whether it be your, the engineer who's prepared the scope of work, um, or, you know, there are folks out there who offer what you would call owner's representative uh, services. Um, and there, there are a couple of firms in town that, that do this. Um, and they will assign somebody to, to be your project manager and, and sort of be your advocate um, to not, you know, to make sure that the GC doesn't, doesn't run wild with this project. And they're not cheap. <laughs> nothing about anything that's happening right now is, is inexpensive. Right. So, yeah. I, and look, I mean, you know, that's, I, I think that it's a critical investment depending on your team. I mean, if you've got an engineer that's actively involved, that's one thing. If you don't, um, you know, it's, <laughs> Joe is, is, is a hundred thousand dollars. Or one hundred fifty thousand dollar investment to protect your fifty million dollar project. I mean, I, I think you have to look at it in the context of the 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 significance of your project. You know, a million dollar project. You know, maybe not so much. But but um, and, and we're going to have a future program on the phases of a storm because uh, this is what we call phase two. Phase five is the last phase, which is when board members get sued, which we had after Charlie, we handled several of those. And, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's issues like, you know, one of the things that we really have tried to emphasize is you're entitled to what you're entitled to. And people are not going to, from their economic perspectives, want to give you everything you're entitled to, but don't get greedy either, because you know one of the things we saw from um, from Irma was you know certain adjusters who took the position that you know it's like winning the lottery and we're going to get you you know a lot more than you thought. We have clients still in litigation with their insurers over Hurricane Irma, which was almost six years ago, um, and you know the associations that are dealing with this can't wait. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't get what you're, you know, entitled to either, or be, you know, afraid to, you know, resist. If a contractor is charging you, um, you know, uh, whatever, um, you know, you name it, Aaron, you see them all. I mean, extension cords you can buy at Home Depot for twenty nine dollars, being rented for sixty dollars a day. I mean, you know, 
complain about it. I mean, if you got to look at contracts and, um, you know, the, that's, that's been happening is going to continue to happen. So, you know, the only real takeaway is, you know, take a deep breath. I mean, you don't have to be first. First is probably going to be not best in, in this arena. And, um, you know, we've, you know, we're, we're, we're just seeing, I, I think, a lot of disasters that frankly are worse than Ian was already, you know, shaping up. So um, I would encourage you to, um, again, uh, look at uh, yesterday's program, um, you know, particularly um, the, the presentation on the FEMA 50% rule. I think from the Sanibel perspective, we got in a lot to the surveying. Um, and feel free to tune in tomorrow. As I said, we're going to have Sean McNulty, who is the chief building official uh, for Lee County. He's going to be talking pretty much primarily about permitting and, uh, and the 50% rule. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our uh, panelists, um, our co-sponsors, Sandcap Bank and CAFMB. Uh, the Honorable Matt Caldwell for taking his valuable time, uh, Ruta Hammer, um, and of course my partners, Ellen, Aaron, and Sanjay. Uh, so again, uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, I hope you uh, found this useful. Uh, hope to uh, see you tune in uh, later. Um, Things to come, we're facing a huge insurance crisis. Um, that's not news to many of you. Uh, we're looking hopefully in the next six weeks to two months to get a little better handle on what's happening there and possible legislative ideas. And we're going to be doing a program on that. We'll be happy to keep CAFMB in, in, informed on that and um, have a good uh, rest of the afternoon all.